Welcome. Welcome to the show, everybody. I want to remind all of you to like and subscribe on YouTube. It's youtube.com slash film talk radio. I'm very excited to have an excellent guest today. He's the director of the new film East Bay starring Constance Wu. Welcome to the show, Daniel Yoon. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. So uh, the movie's brand new, uh, but it took uh, quite a while for it to get to the screen. Do you want to start there? That kind of seems like the beginning. Uh, sure. Um, I actually had initially planned to shoot in uh, 2008, if you can believe it. And then the financial crisis happened and one of my investors dropped out and then I had a bad accident. Actually, I was in the hospital and then ended up starting shooting in 2010. And we got this wonderful actress who had never been in a uh, lead role in a feature before, Constance Wu. <laughs> and she was great. And you knew she was going to do something great, um, as well as the other actresses involved as well. Kavi Ramachandran Ladner and uh, Melissa Pond as well. And we shot, and then it took a long time to edit. I've been looking after my elderly parents, and then I've had some health issues, and uh, it took a long time to get it done, but finally uh, got to the festival circuit this year. Well, and Kavi, I just saw, I was watching Sex, Life, Life, Sex Lives of College Girls, and yeah. she plays the mom of one of the girls. Yeah, and yeah, she's fantastic, um, and she's been in NCIS LA as well, and I think she's got some other projects coming up. When she really adds that comedy element to the film East Bay, I think. Um, w was that fun? Is is she a good collaborator in that way? Covey? Yeah. And she's a great collaborator in every way. Excuse me. Uh, like if if it were nuclear Armageddon and the, the war had been, or the world was divided up into tiny little tribes, and you, I'd want to join the tribe that she was in charge of. <laughs> she's great. She's fantastic to be around. And she's such a hard worker and she's smart. And yeah, it was a it was a treat. Now, your first feature film received the Taos Land Grant Award in the year 2000 at the Taos Talking Pictures Festival. That's right. And uh, were you have you been able to visit the land that you received for the prize? No, I've actually never set foot on it. It's landlocked within a bunch of other parcels of land and uh, the land itself, it's there's no water, there's no road access, there's no electricity. You're in good company because uh, an advisory board member, Chris Ayer, the director of Smoke Signals, he's an advisory board member for the Santa Fe International Film Fest. He also uh, won the land grant prize at the Taos Talking Pictures Festival. And uh, has, of course, gone on to do many things, including the recent Dark Winds. Yeah, yeah. No, he's he's fantastic. And uh, did you attend the Taos Talking Pictures Festival? Yes. In two thousand, how was that? It was wonderful. Um, I I think it's since it's at least on hiatus right now, uh, or maybe it's they've decided just to shut down permanently. I'm not sure, but it was a it was a great fest, and it was great to go to Taos and. Uh, I loved it. Yeah, I think it ran for the first part of the aughts. Mm. Now, the movie is a comedy, but it's also self-reflective. There's also a lot of philosophy in it. Can you talk about that? The Yeah, it's funny. I, I call it a feel-bad comedy. Um, feel-good movies actually make me feel bad. Um, and I, I just something I slowly came to realize it's like, oh, we all have to be super happy about triumphing over adversity in whatever way life forces us to. And so I wanted to make a film that was, that looked at the pressure that people are under to be, at least these days, super happy and successful. I think especially young people. And like, how do you make a film that makes people feel good if ultimately you regard success as a, almost a cop-out in the film, uh, which I, I was struggling with the whole time. And I wanted, so I just wanted to see what these characters could do if they kind of didn't succeed and they just did what they did and they tried to find some meaning and some happiness uh, without being, you know, sort of, I guess, happy, officially happy in the way that you could post to social media. 
Yeah, it's not only self-reflective, but it's wistful in that way. And I, I think there's a lot of parallels to your real life. The character uh, Jack is obviously, Jack Lee is uh, based on you in a lot of ways. And there's those scenes where you're talking to the camera in the desert. You really put yourself out there as, you know, it, it's maybe not a... Um, not a quarter life crisis movie, but maybe uh, a pre midlife crisis is what's going on. I, I think so. I mean, the, the the character is, I and actually most of the main characters are at a point where they are realizing and they don't want to deal with the fact that they are failures in life. They're not losers, but they're failures, and they don't know how to view themselves and what their life and their their future without the concrete prospect of success. And so my character is is more, is further along in that realization process and is in fact almost personally sort of declared war on the idea of success and having to go through this, um, this trial to achieve some sort of uh, trivial form of success. And so he kind of gives up. And so the title East Bay, that's um, that's a neighborhood in San Francisco or a part of San Francisco. Uh, it's the East Bay of the Bay Area. And so it's Oakland, Berkeley, uh, El Cerrito, Emeryville. And the, the original title of the film was Low Budget Ethnic Movie, which I thought was perfectly accurate. And uh, I just figured when people see this film or see a poster for this film, that's what they're going to think. They're going to think low budget ethnic movie. And then that'll be right there in the title. And actually some people loved it. Some people really didn't like it. And so I decided to change it. Now it is, uh, th that title does uh, make sense since it is in a way a uh, send up of Asian themes in films. Do you want to touch on that? Yes. Asian American films, they're interesting to me. I I haven't gone to a festival, an Asian American film festival recently, but when I went to many more with my previous film, to me, they were, they felt like they were stuck in a rut. Um, they, most of the films I saw had to do, were at least tangentially related to victimization of some sort, which is all right. And it's important. Uh, but to me, it's like, it's not just that, like why, the Asian American film doesn't have to be just about that. And I think that is at least was one of the reasons why regular Asian Americans didn't want to go to see Asian American films at Asian American film festivals because, um, because of that. And so in this film, uh, East Bay, there's, it, it's centered partly around an Asian American film festival. And you can see that play out a little bit and the characters are, they have mixed feelings, certainly, about uh, the films that go through there. And your first feature, uh, or some of your earlier work, the short Excuse films me. as well, had um, really done well at Asian film festival or Asian American film festivals, uh, where they were the opening night or the film was the closing night. But you uh, didn't have the similar the let's see, the general film fests in the States weren't paying the same kind of attention to it. Can you touch on that at all? Because I think that's an interesting part of your story. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yes, the film did really well. Uh, Post-concussion did really well with Asian American fests. And um, I, I think it was a feel-good comedy, uh, a sort of a feel-good underdog story where you had relatable characters, fighting against some at least sense of tiny sense of victimization or at least difficulty and then coming out happy and um, empowered. At mainstream festivals, um, you know, I haven't even thought about, I mean, it did well in some festivals, but not in others. And I think part of it was the fact that me as a filmmaker, I, I, I didn't know how to approach festivals. I didn't know how to... Um, to market the film and they were looking for certain kinds of films and it was, it's a different festival world then for sure, but it was on 16 millimeter rather than 35. And I think that was, that was difficult at the time, at least. God, that it, it seems like it was just such a fun set and uh, a really, 
exciting group of people involved. Uh, do you have a producer that um, that you that lends uh, his his or her talents to it? Do you have somebody that's worked with you on a lot of these films, or was it a new producer for East Bay? I work with a fellow named Brad Marshland uh, who lives in the East Bay uh, in Albany, and that's just between Berkeley and El Cerrito, and uh, he's fantastic. And he he called himself. Uh, he would, or he would say to me, uh, Danny, as your spiritual advisor, I would recommend doing this rather than that. <laughs> and he, he was, uh, it was a real privilege working with him, and I hope to do so again. Uh, but actually, a lot of the nuts and bolts uh, producer type stuff I did well in advance of the film. And it's, it is a low budget film. It's a, it's a, and so staying within the budget meant me doing a lot of the, the basic preparation. Yeah, I mean, millions, uh, I mean, movies cost millions of dollars. So when you're tackling a feature film on a shoestring budget, where does that leave you? I mean, how, how do you navigate that world between the millions of dollars that it costs to make movies and the budget that you're working with? Yeah, so that's, that's, you know, everything right there. What you're asking, it's, I mean, you, from the writing, you try to think of an interesting story to start with, things that engage, um, and then that means, and also you try to think of how can I make this film look great without tons of money, and that means yeah, shooting out, do, outdoors. Yeah, how did you do that? How did you make it look so good? Well, part of it was uh, shooting in, in the Bay Area. I, I love the Bay Area, and it's just such a beautiful place, and um so we filmed as many things outdoors as we could and also the shooting style was um, a combination of really wide shots and then handheld uh, long lens shots and so you could get away with say less art direction in that case uh, you didn't have to worry too much about the fact that the walls were bare here and there so um and then with the <clears throat> with the story itself, I mean, it, it's mostly about relationships. And so, uh, and to me, even with the big expensive movies, to me, the favorite part, my favorite parts of those movies are the relationships. Like say, even within like a, a Marvel, a Marvel movie, a, a, an action movie, superhero movie, to me, they get under, they're underappreciated for some of the, the, ex the fantastic writing, especially with the relationships between these odd characters who happen to be superheroes. And that was kind of what John Cassavetes did, right? It was uh, relationships between people. It was dramatic scenes of dialogue and not a lot of, not a lot of uh, sets to build, not a lot of setups and breakdowns. That's right. Are, uh, who are some of your influences that uh, that you look to when making a film like this? Uh, I, I can think of a couple that uh, it that it very much reminds me of. But uh, who were you a fan of that that made you think I could do that? You know, I, I've thought about that question myself, and I don't really have a good answer, and or I'm too embarrassed to actually admit what the answer would be. Um, you see how like it doesn't look like anything special like the camera is stationary but the movement around the camera and the camera itself is is panning back and forth and up and down and it's it feels incredibly natural and not complicated and then you're you're focused on the characters and so yeah that's that's amazing um the, in terms of comedy and the tone i it's funny just they started showing some reruns of cheers recently on on tv up here in canada and that's that again was just so well written and even within the sitcom format it was it's fantastic and the the back and forth between something actually quite dark and something cheerful and funny and characters that are uh, having going through incredible difficulty but still tr sort of being shallow sitcom characters it's um, anyway I, I i i feel like i must have been you know influenced by any number of shows like that growing up I like Cheers too. You know, it's very much like a Neil Simon play or something. Um, yeah. 
so when you're writing uh, this film, uh, are you thinking about the budget? Are you thinking, God, I'd love to have this happen, but I can't have a, a police car show up. I can't have a trolley go by. I, I somewhere in the back of my head, it's there. Um, I wrote. There were some hockey scenes in the film, and I I, re I really wanted a crowd. I wanted it to be as if it were a professional hockey game, um, but obviously I couldn't do that. And so I, I would write just what I wanted to to do, and then I would try to pare things down and be creative and and do it in ways that were different that uh, that wouldn't kill the budget. Like for, for example, there's one scene with a couple of gangsters with guns, and then my character comes along, and then because he has, uh, it's, a, it's a fantasy scene, and he has uh, some fantastic spiritual powers, they just, they fall in love with my character, and he, they give him their guns, and then he shoots a can off of one of their heads, and that was initially supposed to be a police officer, um, and the police officer gives him the gun and they have fun shooting rounds at a garbage can. And, but then I realized I got to get, that would mean a whole, you know, thing to go through having to get a uniform and, and worry about getting permits with you know, some police uniform, et cetera. So. Daniel, I think a lot of, uh, what I've heard from critics and, uh, different people about the film is that they love the parents in the story. Hmm. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about them? I don't want to give away the uh, the comedy that happens during the movie, but uh, what what role or what purpose in the film do the characters of the parents serve? To me, like the the main character is uh, berates himself for letting down his parents and previous generations. Generally, he feels like he's his job is to, given that his parents came to this country and. Uh, sacrifice so much in, in the process. He sh should at least be incredibly successful, be a, a top neurosurgeon and or concert pianist uh, to redeem all of their suffering. And the parents uh, are are not. They don't play. They're no, they're nothing like what he thinks of them in that respect. Uh, they're just they are people who came to this came to North America because. They could, and um, their their lives here were difficult in a way that is very different from how young people young people's lives are difficult, and that is one of the main points of the film. Um, my character says he ultimately he's in his mind con continuously apologizing to his parents and to his ancestors, and the one of the parents conveyed to him that. Well, actually, it was life was hard growing up, uh, but what we had to do was survive, and that is a lot simpler than for what young people have to go through today, which is to be successful and happy, and that's it's it's much 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 more difficult. Um, I think that's part of the introspection we see in the film too. Yeah, and yeah. I I think what you're describing is probably. Uh, a similar story that a lot of uh, children of immigrant parents go through where they've worked so hard so uh, the children don't have to and then the children don't work as hard and they give them a hard time for that. Yeah. Yeah, it's I guess it's all over the map that way. Um, and I think a lot of young folks, well, they, they feel pressure to be successful, but you know, looking at it from the parents' point of view, it's like how, how well, how is that pressure conveyed? And I, I think for the parents, they they want to see their kids be safe and happy. And so when the kids accomplish something in school, like say an A grade or whatever, get into a good university, they're happy for the for the child. And then the child wants to please the parent, and so the child wants to make the parent happy in other ways by continuing to get serve up these successes and that becomes pressure whereas maybe the parent just wants to be happy for the kid and so it's it's not a simple uh, dynamic to me at least well and i think success as a filmmaker can be a blurry thing do you want to say a few words about that and what it's meant to you not just with this movie but maybe in your own life as well if you want i mean uh, please start with uh how it works in the movie for the character in the film who is a filmmaker, success has 
entirely eluded him. Um, and success would be, I think, more traditional success. It'd be uh, recognition from the public, uh, being able to make a larger movie with a bigger budget, uh, you know, critic, critical praise and so on. For me, I think any filmmaker who says they don't want that is lying. Uh, I definitely want all of those things. But at the same time, just to be able to make a film um, is is such a fun thing to do. It's so fun that all these people pay to do it and they're not getting paid to do it. And so to be able to make a few films has been great. Is it enough? No, 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 it, it's not enough because like, how do you live on that? And so it's, um, it's a whole, it's a whole unpleasant answer that I, <laughs> that I, I could that. or could not give. So I, re I recently saw the doc, um, I think it's about uh it's called senior about robert downey senior mm. pulled through the eyes of robert downey jr mm. and it's you know in, it's the 70s the 80s that he and his uh wife at the time are living a wild life and for them all success means is that they can get another 500 bucks to start their next movie or another five thousand mm. bucks to finish the next movie so I think there is that um, that lifestyle element of it, right? Where the success you're looking at is just to keep working, just to keep creating. And is there a greater success down the road at that point? I, I think that's kind of unknown. But you're you're living in the you're living in this, in this world where success means having the chance to keep doing what you love to do for work. You know. I'm I, I guess so. I, I think honestly, it's, it was such a trial to finish this film. And the idea of success was just, can I get this film done? And so the larger question of success that, that we're looking at is nothing that I've really tried to process because it, it's like to me thinking about, you know, about mansions and yachts. It's like so far away. Uh, and in terms of the lifestyle, uh, I every I remember hearing as a kid the phrase suffering the suffering of an artist and as a little kid I thought what does that mean does that mean like like they have to wear uncomfortable clothes or something and then as a teenager I thought okay does that mean like staring into the abyss and then now as as an adult to me it's it's much more basic um it's like having to ask for money uh, or looking, not having money to spend on things or having to co continually negotiate things to try to make something work or for your peers to look at you and say, what have you done? Like, why isn't this done? And the, the, the pain or the shame or whatever that goes along with that is, is significant. And that's what you see like for artists or, or people in the arts generally, um, that's, that's, to me, the unspoken pain or suffering of the artist. And I, and to me, to hear myself say these words, suffering of the artist, it's kind of ridiculous because I'm a filmmaker, I'm not an artist. Like to say you're an artist, it, that's just such a, a self-absorbed thing to say anyway, which I, is another think, thing to be suffering about. <laughs> I, I think you struck me, uh, your character in the film, that this character is a suffering artist, you know? And I thought, it kind of bled through to make me kind of wonder how much is Daniel suffering in his real life that he's putting that raw emotion on screen. And so I, I think that's one really fascinating thing about the film. Have, uh, have people talked to you about that and, you know, kind of confused you with the character? Yes. Uh, yes. That, that to me is especially painful. I, I think it's inevitable. Like you see Henry Cavill as Superman, you just assume that some part of you, some part of your brain thinks that the dude can fly. Um, <laughs> and, or you see uh, any number of actors play certain kinds of roles and you, you think they are, they must be like that without even consciously realizing it. And when I made my first feature post-concussion, it was about a super successful, arrogant young businessman who, who was almost miraculously capable. And people saw me as that after that film. Daniel. You have uh, not just a really good eye for the camera and not just a way of telling a story, 
but when you make the movie, you're collaborating with all these different people. And I think one part where you really shined was your ability to hire actresses and actors. So when you're looking for someone to play a part, how, how do you do that? What, what do you look for? Uh, in the, in the auditioning process, they were, it was just, the choices were so obvious and not that the other actors weren't great, but the ones that I did end up uh, choosing were, were spectacular uh, in, in a unique way. And I felt like they brought more to the characters than I expected, especially uh, Kavi Ramachandran Ludner. I, I felt like I realized within a day of shooting that she had a better grasp of the character than I did, even though I wrote that character. No, but and go and go into uh, Kavi's character because she's a guru. She's also hilarious. There's, uh, she kind of brings the uh, lead character Jack Lee to earth a little bit. Yeah, she's an almost famous guru, uh, and she's sort of famous on local cable access. She's famous with local spiritual community, uh, but she struggles in her personal life. She is advanced in many ways, spiritually, if I can say that, uh, but at the same time, she's very human, and she there are many parts of herself that she hasn't quite reconciled with what she believes on another level, and those differences get exposed, and the my character, Jack, exposes those. He, he sees them right away, in a way, and uh, while on the one hand, he tells himself he's he wants to learn from her spiritually, on the other hand, there's a, a cruel side to my character where he wants to expose this person because he feels like she's probably a phony, which she isn't, but she's she's not a spiritual monolith. She's very much a work in progress. That's how the character gr develops through, the, or her character develops through the film as we sort of see more and more of her. And to me, it's an, a very, very likable character because she's insightful and human and flawed at the same time. When she seems to care about the character Jack Lee as well, I think he's so down in the dumps, but he really does have a lot of helpers, you know, and good ones. Yes, yes. And I mean, she sees something good in him. And at the same time, she sees him as a way to, as a crutch for some of her, her weaknesses. And that is often the dynamic we'll see with with gurus. And Jack is partly aware of that on on sub subconscious level, but at the same time, it it's not fully apparent to either character. And then it plays out and sort of disastrously for both. And then the Constance Wu character is a different kind of helper than uh, the character that Kavi plays. She works at a film fest. She's on a programming team at one of the film fests. Is that yes. right? Yes. 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 And she is, uh, it's in similar to Kavi's character. She's also, uh, to all the characters, she is a work in progress. On the one hand, uh, she's dynamic, caring, kind, uh, very insightful uh, arts administrator. And on the other hand, she's, an intensely emotional and at times vindictive person. And those two different sides really struggle with each other. And once again, Jack exposes those fissures within her personality. And sometimes it's really fun and funny, and sometimes it's awful. And But the two characters bring out things that no one else brings in each other, brings out in each other. And I thought you really uh, brought that um, not the artistic muse, but the artistic cohort uh, to life with her character. Yeah, and I, to me, like any artist or filmmaker cannot survive without that kind of support and assistance. Um, it's And sometimes that kind of support and assistance goes entirely unrecognized entirely unrewarded, even by, by the filmmaker and uh, him or herself, they don't even see it. And it's a selfless act. And I'm sure you have played that role and others at Santa Fe have played that role for any number of filmmakers over the years. And maybe some of them have seen it and maybe some of them have not. Uh, but uh, in, in our case, for the case of East Bay, it was just such a huge gift to, to play at, at Santa Fe and to be a part of it. And I won't forget that. It was an incredible screening and an incredible event. 
Yeah, it played at the Violet Crown Cinema, which is a beautiful theater in the rail yard. It's amazing. And, uh, yeah, it, I, I heard the Q&A was just fabulous. And uh, there was one woman there. She said she'd never been to a film festival before, and it was the greatest experience. And I think uh, you and Kavi being there for it made it that much more exciting for an audience that you know, you're uh, often the director is uh, not on screen, you know, so you're the director and writer of the film, but you also play this major role in it. And so they get to see you and Kavi basically walk off of screen and uh, <laughs> talk to them in person. So, uh, yeah, tell me a little bit about your experience here. Had you ever been, had you spent any time in Santa Fe previously? Uh, just a little bit. And I, I, I had loved it at the time. Um, and it, it, it felt magical. And then I thought, okay, but now I'm coming for another, a second time. It won't feel as magical, but it felt more magical. Uh, and, well, the, and that was 22 years ago. You were last here. Yes. Yes, that is right. Um, and, um, but it was an amazing event. Uh, it, it was unusually just the whole the vibe it's hard to describe the vibe was unusually generous and full of possibility and not phony and not full of you know bs and I, to me it's the best festival experience i've ever had um and i i wish i could make a film every year just so i could be there every year well um, shucks daniel you'll, you'll have to come back for uh jury duty in the near future no, I I would love that, but what an amazing group of people too! From the, the the people on the board, the advisory board, as well as the programmers, as well as the volunteers, it was it was unusual. Um, but yeah, I think we we uh, you know filled a niche in a part of the country where there's a really active audience looking to see new films and exciting films, foreign films. And so I was very captivated by not just the movie, but you yourself as, you know, somebody who had won an award north of us 20 years ago, somebody who made, I think the movie's really an achievement, you know, making this um, what feels like a big movie in so many ways, but it's a low budget film. It's, um, it's got a movie star, it's made in California, it's kind of clicks so many of those block, ticks so many of those blockbuster boxes, and it's uh, really the brainchild of, uh, of you. So when you're, uh, when you're interacting with an audience like that, uh, does that, is that a feeling that um, kind of completes the journey? Is there some closure there? It, it just feels like a huge gift, honestly. It's like, after, especially after having worked on this for so long, mostly by myself uh, in this actual room. <laughs> and uh, yeah, to have people see it and to like see it on the big screen. That was the best technical screening I'd seen of the film as well at, at, at the Crown Violet. Well, um, we should sound... probably give a big up to our tech director, Bryce Warren, who makes yeah. sure everything looks good uh sounds immaculate daniel thanks so much for doing this thanks for joining us this has been another episode of film talk weekly everybody we spoke with the writer director of the new film east bay daniel yoon and we'll see you all next week